Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Asal Ravandi from the Academy of United States Veterans here in Washington, D.C. I have the privilege of moderating this forum on the subject of coronavirus, COVID-19, and veterans. Today's forum is designed to talk about some of the most prominent issues related to the military community and the coronavirus pandemic. I have the honor of um, introducing you to our first three participants, Congressman Paul Gosar from Arizona, who has been in the front lines of activism. Dr. Gosar has managed to pass 16 bills and 24 legislative initiatives into law in such a short time. And this is kind of odd because we never hear members of Congress and the word hardworking in the same sentence. But Paul has been recognized in 2012 as one of the hardest working members of Congress um, of our generation. And that's something that we all need within our communities with respect to our leaders. And of course, we have John Barry, who has not only led troops to combat in the past, but continues to work in the front lines of advocacy as well, defending the constitutional rights of veterans. His firm has been known for hiring the most veterans uh, within its ranks. He's a subject matter expert in problem solving, building strong teams. His law firm has been, has been the recipient of the Department of Labor's Platinum Medallion Award for demonstrating its commitment to hiring veterans. Um, and of course, the firm has been referenced in the media as the USAA of law. And last but not least, we have um, fellow veteran, Navy SEAL, this is a badass that we have among us today, a mobile, hostile, and agile former Navy SEAL who has spent decades serving the community in uniform and continues to serve the community out of uniform. He is the founder and co-owner of uh, Trident CrossFit in Alexandria, which is one of the largest CrossFit institutions in our country. Now it's time to turn the panel over to John. Thanks so much for that introduction, Asal. And I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Congressman Goser. Um, you've supported veterans in the past, and we, and we all greatly appreciate it. What's on the horizon? What, what's next? Well, we got a number of bills, John, you know, that we've been actually pursuing. And, and they're built upon the aspect of empowering veterans, not victimizing them. So one of the things that we've been looking at is the Veterans Health Savings Account Act. We want to make sure that veterans have the access to a, a health savings account, pre-tax dollars, not only for them, but their, for their family, and make it unequivocally across the board. You know, one of the other things that we're looking at is is uh, trying to make sure that our veterans who uh, are disabled and have some moving uh, uh, problems have the ability to be uh, cursed through uh, airports through TSA much quickly. We also got, uh, I always look at the uh, appropriation uh, sector, uh, the Veterans uh, Crisis Hotline. This was instituted back in 2007. Um, but there was really no oversight of it. In fact, many veterans were put on hold and, and told to go elsewhere. So we've been very pointed to make sure that the changes were made and money was there so that our veteran wasn't turned away. They got 24 seven instant access to a trained professional. And in today's world with the coronavirus, we need uh, instantaneous support. The other thing that we're looking at is uh, making sure that we stand up for educational opportunities for our veterans. So we wanna make sure our veterans have the ability to be where they're at, get the learning education they want, not, not going to deep debt. Um, and I think the last but not least is working with our uh, VA nomad centers, making sure that it's not about Moses going to the mountain always, it's about the mountain going to Moses. And that means that uh, our veterans that are in rural, uh, areas that don't have access to health care and incapacitate and, and uh, uh, have the ability to see quality uh, uh, health providers at, at their convenience. That's great. We all we all appreciate especially the opportunities for our veterans. I think we can all agree that 
you know, seeing what our veterans have done in small business and the Fortune 500 companies, I mean, those are, those are the warriors that, that keep giving. I can think of all my you know, brothers and sisters who the first battle was, you know, was, was that time in service. The next battle, they just, they just keep going and keep giving. And, and when I think about what's going on, I think about one of our company core values, this warrior ethos, an army value. Uh, which is, you know, has to do with the fortitude of keep to keep going no matter what and never quit. How do you see people displaying, and I should say Americans, displaying warrior ethos during COVID-19? Well, you know, these are trying circumstances and our veterans, you know, have been under trying circumstances and they, they provided that leadership to ascend the mountaintop. Um, you know, we saw 2.4 million people go on on unemployment last week. So we're, we're, we've seen unemployment, veterans unemployment raised 12 percent. So um, we, we've seen a number of our leaders, our, particularly our veterans in my district, really reach up and, and, and try to help out. People like Jim Muir, who's a uh, veteran advocate up in Payson, and, and uh, Amy Backus, who is actually connected to Payson. they are outreach to veterans, making sure they're OK if there's anything they need. Patrick Kirkendall, who's a state uh, uh, advocate uh, uh, veterans manager, actually helping uh, veterans with uh, uh, their unemployment. Uh, Pat Farrell and his team up in the Jerry Ambrose Veterans Homeless Center up there in Kingman, making sure their veterans uh, are, have a home to be at and, and food to, to be at there. From top to bottom, my district has been uh, advocating, and it always seems that it's a veteran that continues their service to their country by helping those around them. It, it's, it's remarkable and it's humbling that I get a chance to represent people like that. And Chris, what, what about you? I mean, you, you've got to see this warrior ethos, right? Gyms are closed. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the fitness industry to some degree is taking a beating. Now, probably your private gyms or, uh, or private gym equipment is, is, is seeing increased sales. But, but guys like you who are training those warriors, uh, how have you seen that, that warrior ethos come through when, when there are so many factors at play that are stopping people from reaching that physical potential? Yeah, I think with the uh, the attitude that we have as warriors and as as veterans, our true nature is to help each other and continue to move forward. So all the new ideas that are that are being calculated inside this COVID virus, where you have to be responsive, you have to be creative, you have to be forward leaning and kind of adapted to what's happening now. Our leaders and our veterans are sitting are standing together, they're bonding together, and they're finding new ways to build communities, even with social distancing. They're finding ways to build communities and keep pushing forward and pulling their friends along with them. So from the, the physical gym space, yes, a lot of gyms are closed, that's fine. But when we're able to, we have uh, in the, you know, the CDC regulations and, and safety rules and everything, we try to commune via virtual um, Zoom calls and, and Google Hangouts and that kind of thing. So we still try to, to bond together with what we do well and create that community to keep moving forward. So our leaders are doing a really good job of kind of keeping that at the forefront of our minds every day and i think that's important for veterans i mean you talk to most people that get out of service and the thing they miss the most is the team the camaraderie yeah. and those opportunities to do great things together and, and you know physical fitness is one way to one way to carry it out and so i know that sometimes it's a struggle right now but but in the long run i think that uh that this that this is good it's teaching people to to persevere and build that warrior ethos Congressman, I, I want to go back to you. Um, in terms of the health impact on veterans, the, the Hunter 7 Foundation has linked toxic exposure during military service with COVID. What kind of things have you been seeing with uh, veterans exposed to stuff like burn pits, dust storms? Um, are there any initiatives or momentum to reach out to veterans with that type of exposure during this time? Absolutely. And, 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 and going back, you know, the exposure to these burn pits actually debilitates and harms our respiratory system. And when you look at COVID-19, that's the attack, where the attack is. So it's a, an attack on that immune system. So we got to be very cognizant of this aspect. Um, what we've actually seen is, is a, a reach by uh, uh, Congressman uh, Dr. Mark Green. Uh, that looks at the burn pits studies in regards to what was there, how it affected the veterans, so that we can go forward to identify those aspects. But one of the biggest things we have to look at is, is that that could involve 3.5 million veterans. You know, on the registry currently, we have about 200,000. So this has a wide range of applications here. 
And particularly in the day of coronavirus, we want to make sure that that opportunity is is uh, linked. And uh, so this is going to be an ongoing process. The good news about the coronavirus is it's not as problematic as we originally thought. We thought that there were death rates going to be approaching 4%. Well, we're looking at the new guidelines came out last night, and the highest one was 0.018%. So there's opportunities here to start addressing, making sure that we get out, like Chris says, take care of yourself. Get outdoors. The UV light kills these bacteria. Making sure that we take care of ourselves, eat right, sleep right, work out. Uh, and then uh, making sure that new technologies are veiled to us. You know, two of those actually that we f forecasted and moved to the president's uh, advocacy or uh, advisory panel was uh, a nebulizer that takes salt and water and makes hypochloride and it fogs an area. It disinfects, it kills bacteria, viruses and germs up to five microns. Give you an example how this might be used is like a plane. While they're cleaning the plane, they're fogging the plane, disinfecting the plane from the inside out. And as you board, it would mist you. A secondary backup would also be an LED light bulb that actually kills germs. It uses the spectrum of the UV light that actually will survey and kill those viruses and germs in there. So these are two great ways about getting America open again. Um, but once again, we got to make sure that our veterans are taken care of. And because of these burn pits, and the coronavirus at this point in time, they're much more susceptible. So we want to make sure that we're looking out for them, that they're getting that care, the health care that I pre previously talked about, the NOMAD, uh, making sure that our VA access, uh, our Mission Choice Act, making sure that they're seeing their physicians, making sure that they're on top of things. So all those things are, are, are part of the strategy that we've been working with. That's great. And I can remember from my time in Iraq, I can remember the smell of the burn pits, the, the, hey, the dust storms, the fellow officers who I, I consider to be superstar athletes came back and they had problems with with their lungs, with their ability to breathe. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I know that it, this is kind of a seems like a, a, a new topic, but it's been out there for for quite some time now. And I appreciate that everything you're doing to help our veterans with that. Chris, I want to ask you as a as a business owner, and I'll come back to you on this, Congressman, Thanks. in terms of financial impact. What is your message to the veteran business owners and employees who want to get back to work? How do we reopen the economy, get motivated, get back out there and do what veterans do best, which is execute? Execute and serve for sure. I think the first thing we should think about is the messaging that we're sending out to our to our to our, to our veterans, to our people, right? Right now I feel like it's a fear-based message, which is kind of getting people in a in a turmoil or an uproar, and it's kind of keeping them away from going back to work. I think we follow the CDC guidelines that we can put our people and our veterans back to work by, by using the safety protocols that are out there, by using the social distance that are out there, by wearing masks, wear, wearing gloves, then we can kind of involve people back into the workplace. By doing that, we'll also create a confidence in the, the consumers to go back to those businesses as well, knowing that each business owner is responsible in taking the appropriate action for safety inside their spaces, be it a, a, a gym or a grocery store or a hair salon, shouldn't matter. Uh, responsible business owners should make that available to their clients saying, hey, we're doing everything possible to make our businesses safe. Please come in. Please stimulate the economy by spending your money. Please support our business so that we all can kind of get out of this economic, soon to be economic recession that we're going to kind of get into and, and, and re-stimulate the economy. So safety practices for sure and change our messaging to more of a we're doing the right thing and not continuing to put out this fear-based messaging that everybody's reading every single day. Well, and as leaders in the military, we learn to, to mitigate risk, right? We know risk is always out there. We would do our risk assessments and figure out that, hey, we have to deal with risk, but let's figure out a way to mitigate it, to minimize it so that we can accomplish the mission. Congressman Gozer, I wanna ask you the same question. In terms of financial impact, what is your message to all the veteran business owners and employees who wanna get back to work? How do we reopen the economy? Well, first of all, we've got to look at the, at, at the facts. We overreacted. We didn't know a lot about this virus, but what we, what we should have done to the American uh, entrepreneur, the business person, is by saying, that, stop saying you can't, but say you can, but look out for the best uh, and the, 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 the most handicapped people in, uh, in our communities. 
we've got lots of information right now. We've got very, uh, very uh, important groups. The group that is over 70 that has pre-existing conditions and those that have pre-existing conditions that are immune systems are handicapped, they're a separate group. But the rest of us should be going back to work. It's not about if we're going to be exposed to coronavirus, it's when. We have to understand our immune system. Our immune system wants to encode for these bacteria, these viruses, but they want to do it when we're healthy. Remember the old deal? Uh, you guys are probably a little younger than I am, but uh, when my mom gathered us all up and we went over to Johnny's house and we're like, why are we going to Johnny's house? Well, they got chicken pox. Well, if we we're all healthy. That's what you wanted to encode, you know, that aspect. So you have to understand the immune system about how it responds and then put yourself in the best circumstances. Chris said it very right, is, is that veterans are true leaders. They've had to mitigate those risks and make sure that they, they, they don't make the cure worse than the disease. That is, that, that is problematic. Um, they need to have their voices up and saying to like governors, like governors in Arizona, like Governor Ducey, time's up. You got to get, get us up there. People like Chris that are very uh, in tuned with that, working out. We should have encouraged people to go outdoors. We should have encouraged people to sleep better, to, to eat better, to take care of themselves. This is a wake up call to take care of ourselves much better. And I think uh, the opportunities will be there. I think uh, what Congress did to make sure that there was money uh, for businesses, veterans alike, uh, I think was a good thing. However, time's up. We, we can't continue this experiment in socialism where the government tells me what I can do, what I can't do when I can do it, how I'll do it. Um, we got to get back to that, that entrepreneurial, that uh, challenge uh, and, and overcome like the veterans have so uh, uh, done for countless ages. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, we find ourselves in situations where that there, there's new challenges, but, but for veterans, we've been there, right? We know yeah. what, it, what it's like to have to accomplish the mission under severe constraints and, and, and find a way. Um, now, now, what I have heard, especially from veterans organizations, I hear about financial constraints. You know, is the stimulus package addressing these concerns and are there other initiatives being explored to support our veterans organizations? Uh, there are. So you saw the CARES Act in regards to trying to get a PPP and then some of the money as loans, uh, low interest loans to businesses that uh, we're having some problems. You know, the government actually impugned this on businesses. And so they're par partly responsible. I'm a very fiscal conservative, but I've also um, have to make the government accountable for its trials and tribulations against the American uh, veteran, American worker, the American businessman. And we saw it, seen, seen that in some of the things I've highlighted, whether it be healthcare, whether it be burn pits, uh, all the way across the board. Um, we're going to start looking at the liability uh, risk association. That is something that's coming on the table. Uh, we want to make sure that the money uh, uh, for small businesses uh, is tweaked. There's a couple little nuances that we found that were causing problems for, for small businesses. We want to give them some flexibility. You know, it's that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, it's a veteran that has been given that leadership that looks at I can do, not I can't do attitude that will start bringing this forward. The problem that I see, John and Chris, is that this is a partisan uh, environment, right? Hyper-partisan environment. Uh, but the good news is, is there's one group out there that both sides play to and play with, and that's our veterans. And so if there's a, if there's a group out there that can mitigate this and take us to the next level, it's veterans. And so I would hope that our veterans would, would be reaching out to your members of Congress, to your U.S. senators and saying, listen, this is how the PPP, the, the loan uh, uh, system actually worked. Here's how it could have better affected us. These are the supply chains that we need to make sure that we're empowered for success, not uh, doomed for uh, failure. Um, and and, and uh, our interactions with foreign entities like China, bringing that business home manufacturing service is huge getting that, that that done and our veterans are are right on the on the tip yeah and that's and that's that's great to hear that, that these things are out there and the veterans are getting getting this opportunity and, and chris from your perspective as a as a warrior business owner you know i know people are coming to you for uh support in terms of 
fixing their bodies. But I got to imagine other veterans or uh, business owners are reaching out to you as well. I, I noticed that in, in my business. Even former clients are calling us to say, hey, how are you guys doing? Um, and really checking and doing those buddy checks uh, that we did, you know, back when back when we were in service, making sure we're doing OK, showing support, showing we're members of the team. Have you seen that in the veteran community, Chris? And I've seen that in the veteran community. It's skyrocketing how much we all need. We used the word before, uh, John, how much we all want to be part of that team. And what we do well as veterans is, is, is participate and contribute to being part of that team. So each new person, each person that comes about, what they're trying to do is find purpose, find intent, and find belonging, right? So we need to encourage our veterans to go out and, and find things to do, give them something to do. It's gonna stave off the isolationism, isolationism, of social distancing so giving our veterans something to do putting them back to work it's going to heal a lot of problems that we have right now let me ask you both this um i work out uh there's a cardiologist i work out with and he says you know hey there's more damage than being in a you know people laying around their couch all day than what the covid virus could do you to physically and he did say this he said look i think we're fine uh, you know, the summer things are going to slow down, but he said, wait till the fall, wait till the kids are back in school. Uh, I think there's going to be a second wave. Well, what have you heard about that? I'm, I'm curious about both of your your impressions on this. Uh, I, Chris, I know from a, a, a trainer standpoint, you say, well, vitamin D is good. People are outside exercising more. They're going to be healthier. They're not going to be as susceptible to, to disease. But what do you think? I agree with you. I think there's going to be a bounce back or a reoccurrence of this virus. Um, I want to put out this. There's a in the CrossFit world, there's a sickness, wellness, uh, sickness, uh, fitness, sickness, wellness criterion, which says before you get sick, if you're fit, you have to go through wellness, right? So a healthy body, a, he a healthy physical structure is going to be stronger during a virus than a non-healthy body. And we're experiencing that right now. Most of the deaths that we've seen with uh, COVID-19 is people who have a comorbidity for predilection for, di uh, for diabetes, uh, respiratory illnesses, all those things where people are dying from this illness. So if you keep your body healthy, if you keep yourself safe, the chance of you having a dire effect of this virus, I say, are lesser. So yes, I do believe that muscles stop bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Congressman Bosco, what, what do you know or what have you heard or what do you think about, about, about a second wave coming? Well, it almost always does, uh, John. Uh, it doesn't matter what uh, the, the the issue, whether it be a, a flu uh, or the COVID, you're gonna see a bounce back. And that's because not everybody treats uh, their health like Chris does, or you do, or like I do. Um, but this is a good warm up for that, is what we ought to be teaching that to our school children and, and to high school kids, uh, you know, to our assisted living uh, folks. Over and over again, we ought to be doing this, preaching that aspect of you've got uh, a skin in the game. It's up to you to meet me half this, this issue halfway. And then there's other opportunities that I'm going to see that we'll mitigate it. We now know that, like, for, for example, in Taiwan, here's a community on an island of 24 million people. How did they weather the storm so close to China better than we did? You know, they used uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, with uh, zinc and zithromax pads, uh, packs uh, for people that were most susceptible. Interesting. You know, here's, here's a, here's a pre-op. Then you start looking at this uh, uh, process in regards to uh, vaccine. It, it's streamlined really fast, and, and now they're actually doing trials. So there may be something to that as well. Uh, but this goes back to good old public health, uh, the advocacy that you know uh, our mothers taught us. Eat right. well, sleep well, take care of ourselves, You know, uh, making sure that you don't put yourself in harm's way. I mean, you guys are experts at getting in harm's way. We, 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 we forced you there. And so from that standpoint, I think an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we got some of these new new technologies. You know, America has been always an innovator about how do we take care of uh, and, and, and advance forward. I gave you two of those technologies that uh, are moving forward. But there's tons more. Um, so there's going to be some. But we now know the numbers don't equate to the, the, the hair. You know, the, the sky is falling. Sky is falling. It's another one of those diseases out there, and it can be mitigated. Well, and we know from history that innovations in, in medicine actually come often during wartime, right, where we are yep. forced to 
be innovative. And so here we find ourselves again in, in, a, in a different kind of war where we have to be innovative. And I think back to my time and and Chris, I don't know, did you go through Ranger School? Uh, no, with the buds. Seal. Okay. I know some of the, <laughs> some of the seals go through. Some went through yeah. with me. But when we went through, they would give us this. They call it the peanut butter shot. And I think it was called gamma globulin. They give you this <laughs> shot, and it hurt. You know, lack of sleep, lack of food. And, and, and we didn't get sick. And, and that, that shot helped. And so I think as we you know, have these uh, opportunities for medical advances and, and you know, that, that we need to see them just as that, that this is a horrible thing that's happening, but it is an opportunity for us to advance. And, and, and with that challenge, I want to ask both of you, you know, one last question. This is a question that veterans frequently ask me. What can I do to help? Right. Well, I, I think is let your voice be heard. I, I, I think Chris said it very well as well as you, John, is is the way the veteran aspect is it's always about a team reaching out to make sure the lesser of, of our group is is accounted for, making sure that they're put into a situation where they can flourish. That's a big key here. And and not taking no for an answer. That's the one thing I love about veterans. If something is wrong, stick they stick with it. No, nope, we're not going to do it that way. We, 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 we want to do it this way, and it's ver verified. We've got a backup plan. You know, this is how we want to look at it. And, and making sure that people know that there are plenty of opportunities out there. And if there's a, a squeaky wheel, tell me about the squeaky wheel. Who's the one holding that up? Uh, I'm, I'm very versed at, at, at holding people accountable within the bureaucracy. This shouldn't be about um, you can't. It's about you can't. Help me find a way to do it. And the only way you do that is not by talking. It's by asking questions and reaching out to people because they're going to give you the solutions. You know, I was a dentist in a previous life. And if you come in my office and you're in an emergency, I don't just start working on you. I got to ask you, what hurts? Where does it hurt? How can I help you? And I think that's the biggest key that our veterans can do is making sure that everybody is accounted for getting the services, making sure that people, if they're, if they're in trouble, are alerted to make sure that they're getting the, the care that they need. And, and I appreciate that, that straightforward, honest answer. Chris, you can probably identify with what a lot of veterans are hearing, which is uh, what we would hear, hey, uh, stay on the fob, don't go out there, right? You know what I'm saying? Stay out of harm's way, right? Well, we're, it's like deploying, right? And they say, oh, no, no, don't go outside the wire. You know, we, you're gonna help everybody by staying here. And you know, we, we train to fight. We train to, to 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 solve problems. We train to move forward, and it's it's refreshing to hear to hear a, a member of our government say, "No, let's go out and be proactive, not hey, just stay home and shut up." So I appreciate that, Congressman Chris. What about you? I mean, in terms of what can our veterans do now to fight this battle to help us? Yeah, I think that since most states are going into phase one, kind of phase two thing. Ask what you can do first off. Give solutions, find out the problems, give solutions to the to the to our government so they can make better decisions. But as an individual, as an individual veteran, you can ask, what can I do to help? Is there somewhere I can place myself to be useful for the community that I'm in? Barring all the safety stuff as well. But ask what you ask what you can do first, and then someone will help you find out what that's going to be. I love the idea from a veteran-based business is that I am going to do everything in my power to invite people into my community, right? I think we strive as veterans, as community individuals, I think we strive together and we are stronger together. As veteran business owners, we should help the people that are making decisions, our governors and our mayors making decisions by maybe defining how we run our businesses and what we can do to create a solution so that we can get people back into the, in, into the economy and back into our businesses. I think there's a little disconnect between how I run my business and what the person that's telling me how to run my business, there's a disconnect there. There's a disconnect because we're not communicating. I haven't stood up and said, well, here's a solution for how we do things. I think if more people do that, the sins will come a little bit faster um, and then we can get more businesses open uh, in the phase two kind of phase of uh, COVID-19. So exercising extreme ownership of the problem, right? Even though totally. you've got constraints, You've got guidance that you may not agree with, but you are doing what you can. And you realize sometimes you've got to lead up that chain of command. Yes, 100 percent. 100 percent. Well, thank you both, gentlemen, for your time here today. Uh, if there's any parting words of wisdom you want to you want to give us, give to the veteran community about how to get through this or what to do next or how to use this uh, tragedy to get better. Please, please share that. 
Chris, you want to go first? Yeah, I think we have to look at this not from a naysayer or a fear-based uh, idea, but when, what are we grateful for? What has this virus taught us that we have forgotten about because we're so busy in our everyday lives? I'm grateful for the time I'm spending with my wife. I'm grateful for the time I can reflect and I call my mother every day now. I was too busy before, right? So we should look at the good things that this, this, COVID, uh, this virus has brought to us. Like, man, let's reassess our priorities in life. What's really important? I get to spend more time with my family, right? I don't have to drive everywhere. I can go on a walk with my dog, right? Yes, I can connect out using virtual means. So all the good things that are coming from this virus, let's pay attention and understand and learn those and keep it in the new norm instead of just racing it back to the old norm that we had. The old norm that we had got us where we are now. What are we going to do to move forward? Uh, John, I agree with Chris. You know, this is a golden opportunity for us to reflect, sit back and reflect about how wonderful this country is and the opportunities that we have. We've seen a movement now uh, across the country, whether it be Michigan or Pennsylvania, saying, wait a minute, my inalienable rights, those freedoms, those liberties, those, but it comes with accountability. And it shouldn't have been about we can't, it's about what we can do to, and the entrepreneurial aspect of how do you work to, to include everybody. It, I think it brings back that American spirit, you know, about, uh, you know, you, we can't help anybody unless we help ourselves. And I think that's very, very, very poignant right now. And our veterans are those leaders. They're those heroes that so many people look up to. I challenge my veterans to say, look at when you see young kids, tell them why you're doing it and what you're doing and, and how you worked from to get to that state. Because when we share our experiences, when we share some of those fail failures that we had, we learn so much more. And we show that humanness that people identify with. If you don't identify with people, you'll never learn from them. And our veterans are such a, 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 an asset. We need to have them rise to the occasion, make sure that they're whole, that their team is together. And then don't be afraid to speak out, like Chris said. You want to challenge, why not? You know, when I first went to Congress, uh, I was in the big class of 2011, and I was known in Arizona as always asking questions. Well, John Boehner got up there and said, We're gonna, we do this, 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 and all of a sudden I raised my hand, and there were 13 other people that were saying, why do we do it that way? And he goes, right. because. And we go, that's not good enough. Tell us why you do it that way. And that's why we got to do it. That's, that's that, that questioning that makes America great. Outstanding. Well, I want to thank both of you gentlemen, not only for your time, but your continued service to our nation. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, thank Chris. You. Welcome back, everyone. We will continue the dialogue with Dr. Micro Hamilton. She is a subject matter expert in driving human performance, and we will hear more about her expertise within the veteran space and how she perceives the current situation to evolve and unfold. I would like to start with Dr. Hamilton. We want to kind of touch base on the mental health aspect of the current pandemic and how you see our community adapt and cope with the pandemic. And if you could elaborate on what you know within your space that could impact our communities or could be helpful. You know, there's a spectrum of vets who have really good coping skills and they're going to move through this in a nice way. Generally, they've been the ones who recognize that the, the way to a clearer space is to slow down. Then you have those who are in the sort of in the middle lane where they're stressed their skills have been sort of um, deteriorating over time and their nervous system and their, their psyche have gone into constant contraction. Now, they could still hang on. And yet when faced with a continuous crisis like this, the tipping point will be reached very quickly. But then you have the ones who are not coping well at all. Right. And you're seeing the increase in um, I, I, I like to look at things as kind of what is the system doing? The system can implode or it can explode. They hang on to it and it reflects across their 
their family base, their community, their, their uh, sort of tight knit structure. But then you also see the exploding type of expression, right, which may lead to actions that are not beneficial, one for them, two for uh, the, the local, the family structure, the community, and then three for our uh, national sort of process as a whole. So it, it, as you look at the different, um, where they show up on that spectrum that I just laid out, it's, it's interesting to recognize that, that there's one central thing that, that when implemented and when followed, so the, the strategy implementation of the slowing down, and, and what I mean by that is can the individual access a, a more of a still and clear place, right? Tactical breathing absolutely works. It restores the system. You know, in the anxiety, they're breathing so fast and the signals being sent to the brain and mind are something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. So if we simply address the breath itself, then, then we have a tool, a in real time tool to get them to really slow down and center. Just to follow up to what we just talked about, a lot of people, uh, you know, we're focused on the public health aspect of this pandemic. Of course, it's a public health crisis. What we're, we're forgetting is that mental health is also a major part of our public health or rather lack of it. And what do you have to say to those individuals that are discounting the impacts of mental health issues as we isolate individuals during this time of crisis? It's, um, I'm going to say that it's imperative. I'm going to use the word imperative. If you just say, let's look at one thing, let's take isolation, and we say, what does it do in the complex human system? The disconnection from humanity pushes the system over. If it's already in a fragile state, it's going to, to push over into the breakage zone, right? Into the place where it's going to be challenging to restore it. We can restore it. And if I'm fearful, if I'm disconnected, if I don't have any type of human nurturing, human nourishment, human con connection, I cannot see and be clearly. And in this particular population, it's going to be so far reaching that we're going to be going, oh my God, how did we not see this sooner? If America wakes up, and I'm, and this isn't in any way negative because we're all doing our best, but if we can just send a lens of focus to how all of this crisis is affecting the mental realm, right, and the connections of, of how, how we interact and interrelate as humans, mm -hmm. uh, then we can play it strategies right but because it isn't being aspected in this way it's challenging to lay in strategies right of course i've actually heard some people often say that they thought they were introverts until coronavirus took over our communities thank you so much for that wonderful insight and my next question is for john and you know there's been a great deal of concern about the department of veterans affairs response during the pandemic and um, since you're in the front lines uh, with your clients and within the community, um, what has been your experience with how the VA has responded and what are your thoughts on the matter? Well, on, on the disability benefit side, you know, you have, I think most people don't understand this, that the VA medical center, right, is, 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 is separate from the group that processes the VA disability claims. So the VA regional office and the VA medical center are not the same thing. Uh, I can tell you that the VA regional offices in terms of processing veterans disability claims has done a great job of keeping up, processing those claims, uh, processing those appeals and, and, and getting the veterans paid. We, we've, seen, we've seen some great work being done there. It has not shut down. Uh, they have not, uh, the, the pace has not slowed. Now on that side of things, there still are issues with uh, uh, hearings, right? Hearing officers, in-person hearings, um, there's opportunity for hearings like these, Zoom hearings, but, but that process has been, has been slowed down. And so, um, you know, for veterans that, that want to have hearings, um, that process has slowed a little bit by COVID, uh, but overall, the system is working well. 
Now the VA medical center is, is, is a different side and there are veterans, you know, we, we've heard lots of, you know, different stories. And I think a lot of the fear was that, well, um, these VA hospitals are gonna be used to treat COVID patients. Who's gonna take care of our veterans who need help? And so from that perspective, I think that uh, there, 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 there's been a lot of fear and concern. But for the most part, we've heard that our veterans have been taken care of, and that's the right thing to do. So I, I can say that I am proud of how our country has responded, how we have not forgotten our veterans in this fight. Uh, and, and some of our veterans are more vulnerable due to burn pits, due to uh, the, the, the dust storms, due to uh, you know, some, of the, some of the chemicals they were exposed to in service. But I would tell you that uh, that our, our country has stepped up, the VA has stepped up and 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 helped our veterans. Now, like I said, that doesn't mean the system is perfect, and, and the system wasn't perfect before. But I can say that uh, we have not seen the bottom fall out or anything horrible happen. Um, and so I think that overall, while this is a very challenging time for everybody in our country, I am proud that we have not forgotten our veterans. I'm proud that our government continues to provide them with assistance. And like I said, I understand that at times like these, there's shortages of everything and, uh, and, and not everybody can get optimal service. Uh, and, and, and as veterans, we know that. We've worked through constraints before. Uh, we, we, we've seen that from, from day one. And I can think from 20 years of service, we were in, I think, uh, you know, in the 90s, when there wasn't a whole lot of money to do much of anything. I remember being deployed to Bosnia and a general officer came and talked to us and he said, you know, the pendulum's gonna swing the other way. And by the time I was in Iraq, several years later, uh, we had the funding and everything that we needed. But, 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 but we know that the pendulum goes back and forth and, and that you know, there, there is scarcity of, uh, of medical equipment supplies and that you know, you're not always gonna get uh, everything you need when you need it. But as veterans, we know we have to adapt, we have to overcome, and we have to make it work. And so I'm not disappointed, uh, you know, in what's happened. I know that a lot of people have felt a lot of strain, a lot of stress, but we have not forgotten our veterans. And that's something I think we can be proud of. Um, thank you so much, John. Now that we are on the subject, I'd like to kind of touch on what you talked about, about the veterans benefits. And naturally, the process has slowed down. And while we can't help the process and expediting uh, the cases to be seen, I'm sure we all agree that a sense of anxiety along with other issues that we're facing in our daily lives come over our community. And um, I wanted to ask Dr. Hamilton, as these claims slow down, as the sense of certainty kind of decreases and we kind of find ourselves back into an environment where um, uncertainty takes over and we just feel insecure about the future. How do you see anxiety is impacting our community? What are your recommendations? When when you look at right, the increased, I always look through ops tempo, right? So, so now you have all of these factors that we weren't dealing with before. And so of course, of course, there is discomfort from the unknown. Right. And when you when, when we talk about veterans in particular and things like, you know, claims being held up and the things that they thought were coming. And this is this is all humans. When when a when we think that something is there for us, that something has been um, promised to us, something has been offered. And now all of a sudden, because something happens, it's it seems to be taken away. It, it's not taken away, as you said. We're, we're doing we're doing a good job, but it seems to be taken away. So the fear begins to take over through the anxiety. So fear and anxiety together, and now right, they're not sleeping as well. It's simply the unknown, and uh, to me, addressing the unknown, like the the ability to communicate that they are being cared for, and I mean literally, hey, John. Um, you know, you, uh, here's where your case was before COVID, and let me tell you where we think it is right now, so that you have a bit of comfort, even if it's an email, right? Some type of communication that goes, okay, good, all right, it's 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 not gone, it's coming, and it's probably not going to be that long, right? Compared to the timeline I thought I had. So for for me, as as we are able to give ourselves more information it brings comfort there's like a okay i can breathe again i don't have to be so afraid of x right so i think 
think that is is transparent communication that is more personal, right? Where they're not just like you said it. What the day I retired and I'm 30 years, it was like I didn't exist anymore, and I'm okay with that. But a lot of people can't function that way, right? Sure. But the but the having the communication of look, you still are there, you still matter, and actually you matter more than ever because we know how this is affecting you. It's it's all. I mean, it, it's interesting to call it a PR campaign, and yet it's a human campaign of transparent communication. And and what does that take? Who knows? But I know it's possible, right? Okay. So anxiety decreases with information. You know, one of the struggles we've had for uh, decades, right, is veterans don't know when they're going to get those disability benefits. You know, sometimes it's it's going to be in six months. Sometimes it takes six years with appeals. And so it's that disappointment. It's the, well, when are they going to make a decision? We don't know. Now, like I said, with COVID, that hasn't changed. But that's enlightening to hear from you say, yeah, but it means more to the veteran now. That uncertainty means even more. And, and what we've struggled with is, you know, our clients, they want to know, now, hey, this thing's been on appeal for two years, and then I didn't get the right decision, so I had to appeal it again. It's still on appeal. I'm having financial difficulties. You know, I'm going through a divorce. I'm going through a bankruptcy. All these things are happening. When is the VA going to decide my case? And, you know, that hasn't really changed with COVID, unfortunately, but I, I, I think that's a great you know, insight that I that, that I wish I would have grasped onto a little bit tighter is that during these times of uncertainty, it's even more important. And unfortunately for us, our answer doesn't change because we don't get that answer from the VA. When are we going to get a decision? Absolutely. And John, you're such an effective leader. I have been um, reading about your style and just, just how you navigate within the community with your clients. And um, one of my, one of your favorite sayings that I love is, a victory is a decision. And sometimes people look at influential leaders like yourself or Dr. Hamilton and they say, well, that's easy for you to say. Um, how do I make a decision to be a victor in my situation? Sure. So you, you decide to win. I mean, it isn't much different than when I was a young infantry officer and we would talk about backwards planning, right? We knew when the mission was going to take place. We knew when we were going to hit the objective. And so we had to backwards plan from there. And so if I say that I've decided, you know, that I am going to win my VA claim, I may not know when that time is going to be. Um, and, I, and I start to backwards plan. I realize there may be uh, times where I'm going to need someone to help me, right? And so if I'm deciding that I'm going to win, I know that I'm going to do everything necessary, whether it's uh, get someone else on my team to help me, whether it's get that evidence, whether it's medical evidence or buddy statements, but I am going to be proactive to make this happen, and I'm not going to quit until I win. And we've represented veterans. It's taken them over 10 years to get the disability benefits they have earned through their service, but they've made that decision. Now, fortunately, uh, you know, with very law, we, you know, we, we say, hey, we'll fight alongside you here. But we've had clients say to us, you know, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. Like we say, hey, you know, we will help you. We'll help you get through it. And, and I don't think that's different than anything else in life, right? If you say, you know, I want to run a marathon, you make that decision and you start training. And every day, once you've made the decision, you're going to run. You, you just are. It doesn't matter if it's raining out. It doesn't matter if it's cold out. You've come up with a training plan. You have committed to it. And after you commit, you will develop that capability. Maybe you're not a marathon runner now but that's what you want to become. And so once you commit to that end state, to that victory, then there really is no question about what your actions are. Your actions follow the plan that you set forth. And I think once we make that decision, it's a lot easier to put the blinders on and go for it than if, we're, if, we, if we waffle about it, if we're unconcerned, if we're worried about the environment, all these factors that we cannot control, right? Those prevent us from winning. But if we decide, hey, I'm going to win, everything in my power that can be done will be done. I'm going to do it. Then we, we feel in control, right? Dr. Hamilton talked about the feeling of, you know, we don't know what's, what's going on and the uncertainty. Well, there's always going to be uncertainty and there's nothing you can do about it. But you get to decide how you show up every day. You get to decide whether you're going to win by your actions. And maybe in the end, maybe you do lose. But we don't accept defeat, right? We're veterans. Uh, we have to keep coming back and we have to keep fighting. So for me, you know, and, and I try to you know, instill this in my team members, uh, just as I did with my soldiers and, and fellow officers, hey, 
we've decided to win, we're gonna take the actions necessary to get there, and that gives us control of the situation, especially when it's uncertain. I mean, we all know uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and we all know the enemy has a vote in what's gonna happen in our daily lives, right? But the control that we have is deciding to win, and that then, once we make that decision, we just move forward, and it just becomes second nature to do the things we need to do, um, regardless of what's happening in the outside environment. Okay, so we have a couple of audience questions that we would like to bring to your attention. The first question is from Harrison. He's the CEO of Nor Northern Colorado Veterans Resource Center. And Harrison asks, uh, um, how are veterans currently dealing with the stress of isolation, uh, which the pandemic has created and encouraged? Who would like to go first? Um, I'm happy to just, you know, I think it's, it's, it's been interesting. I mean, it's, we've had some veterans that, uh, you know, have, have, it's been difficult, um, you know, as a, as a commander, uh, I've had some of my, uh, you know, some of my former soldiers commit suicide. And, and just the other day, I, I got word from, uh, from a buddy that, uh, the, the, that one of his soldiers committed suicide. And so, I mean, that the 22 a day is, is still very real, despite what's going on with COVID that's making, you know, COVID's making it worse. And so, you know, I've seen on that and I've seen a lot of, of struggles, uh, but I've seen a lot of, of veterans groups, especially on social media, where say, hey, somebody please just reach out. You know, we're, we're here to help. So I've seen I've seen the, the, the dark side of it, but I've also seen veterans uh, who, who seem to be more engaged, willing to help. Hey, if somebody needs something, please contact me. Um, so I, I've kind of seen it both ways, but it does it is it is troubling to know that our, our veterans, those that suffer with post-traumatic stress disorder, are feeling more alone now than ever. Now that being said, and Dr. Hamilton can probably get, expound on this, but you know, a, a lot of my uh, friends with PTSD, they they're kind of happy quarantining. They don't like to go out in public. They they enjoy being on their own. They don't want to be bothered, and uh, and and they they don't like crowds. And so for them, this really hasn't you know this really isn't a big deal. They you know they still call their buddies on the phone. They still uh, they're still on social media. Um, they're still interactive with their groups and their close friends. But really, they don't like to go out, and and, that, and that's okay. So for them, um, it, it hasn't been that big of a deal. Um, and and with the uncertainty, like I said, we've all as veterans, we we know what uncertainty is, and. Uh, I, so I, I've seen the whole gamut, really, it run from one one side of the spectrum to complete despair to veterans that want to help to veterans that say, hey, this, you know, this really isn't affecting me a whole lot. This is I kind of like this. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamilton. So I, I sit on the performance end. So my my exposure is to people who even if they have PTSD, they don't think they have PTSD because we don't call it that. We just go, hey, this is this is what we do. And it's not really that big of a deal. So so that's that's more of the lens that that I'm watching is uh, really prepared people, whether they have that that label or not. Um, enjoying, and this is an interesting comment, right? It's, it goes to what you said, John. There are so many people who are, um, you know, looking at this event, and, and you know, in service, we train for the unexpected. So they look at it, and, and they're actually, many of them, even more prepared than what I would say the civilians are experiencing because they've had exposure to right things that are unknown before. So, so the, my community is um, looking into their lives and going, wow, this is an interesting opportunity for us to create change, beneficial change. And they're seeing the systems that are kind of breaking down and going, what, what is my expertise? How can I help in that system? Right. And I'm one of those. Right. I, I simply want to serve now where I'm best suited to serve. And so that's what I watch with a lot of you know, my veteran communities. And um, and of course, we're all reaching into communities that can use expertise on the stress side um, or the seeing things differently side of looking towards victory instead of victim. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of like what's going on across all the lanes. Our second audience question was submitted anonymously. And the question is, service members learn to suppress their injuries so that they don't get sidelined. Does this reflect in veterans avoiding help now? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. 
you can't quit, right? If you're injured, uh, you don't want to, first of all, you don't want to be seen as a quitter, but you never want to quit on your team. And unfortunately, I think that that, you know, the stigma of, of needing help, of being injured, uh, you know, we like to say injured, not broken. Going to get help, you're weak. And so we have to overcome that stigma and say, no, you know, it takes strength to, to ask for help, uh, especially when you really need it. And, you know, with high performers, we don't want to ask for help. In fact, you know, sometimes it's a source of pride. Like I'm going through these five things and I can still kick your ass. You know, that type of attitude, right? So I think that from from the the, the perspective of the real, those veterans who are, we just, you know, the, we our champions who, who you know, they, that, that NCO that never let us down, that was always staying late, that was always helping everybody. You know, that NCO doesn't want to be seen as, as someone who ever needed help. And so I think it's very tough for them to come back, especially when they reach that hero status amongst the troops. And then for them to come down and say, yeah, guys, hey, I, I need help. I've got problems. Um, you know, it's kind of like being a parent. You never want your kids to see you as a bad as a bad person. And so I think it's the same way even out of service. You don't want your community to see you as someone who might be broken, who might be weak. Absolutely. And Dr. Hamilton? So this is this is encouraging, right? So um, we we began working um, a bit differently on the active duty side about five years ago, and, and it was for this, John, it was for culture change. We must have them disclose their injuries, they must, or the system doesn't work, and then we look back and go, oh my God, now I don't get any of the benefits that I'm rightfully entitled to, right? So, so what we started doing was going, okay, um, this isn't going to keep you from service. It's simply documenting that this is going on, right? Let's get it on paper so that when you get to the VA, we don't have to go, there's no record of this, even though we all know that you experienced it, right? And so th this was in all of the special operator communities, in, in all of the right, TS communities, they're the ones who are most having issues with this because it's their very life and service that's tied to that. And so it, it's, it must start really early on in the pipeline on the active duty side so that then it crosses over into the VA in a seamless way uh, where, where their, their injuries don't remain invisible. Ever, yes, that, that's accurate. Thank you so much. And, and I think that we are you know, right on the money. You know, the situation hasn't changed. Um, if those who have um, held back um, seeking help um, continue to do so for all the reasons that both uh, John and Dr. Hamilton indicated. Um, as we um, exit out of this, this forum, I'd like to um, invite John to provide um, any um, closing thoughts to our audience. It's all about team. Winning is about team and you know who i'm that conversation we, we just had about veterans not getting help you know who usually contacts us about the veterans having ptsd it's the spouse the family member those people who have suffered too because of the disability and and they're reaching out to us saying can you help can you help and and i think that you know it's but but those that do get better those whether it's because they filed their disability claims or because they went to the va hospital to to seek treatment uh you know it, it's, it's a team effort nobody does it alone whether a veteran needs someone to physically help them get to the hospital or whether it's just having that support group. But we learned in the military that we win as a team. And we remember from those days at boot camp or basic where if you if one person screwed up, we all did push-ups as a team, right? And so it really is the going back to that support of the team, whether they're present uh, in your day-to-day -day life or whether they're your, your buddies that you need to reach out to, to stay in contact with, to, to remember what it's like to be part of a great team. But to be successful, to win at anything, you got to be part of a championship team. You can't do it alone. And when you start getting alone and you start focusing on yourself, that's usually when you start to get negative. But when you focus on the team, you stay positive. And, and in the end, you need the team to be successful. So, you know, go out and be a hero to one of your team members today. This concludes our Coronavirus and Veterans Forum, and we thank all our participants for giving us their invaluable time and informing our community. Thank you so much, and be great and be safe.